Hello, everybody. I'm back for scene seven. Um, now Duncan has arrived at the castle they've entered. All right, and the suspense, uh, the suspense continues to build. As you can see, these scenes are pretty short. And the audience pretty, know, pretty much knows what's going on. You guys pretty much know um, the intent that Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have here. So things are starting to get tense. Okay, so we have hot boys, torches, enter a sewer and divers. Okay, these would have been servants, um, servants with dishes and service over the stage. Then enter Macbeth. So you'll notice that Macbeth has a bunch of lines here. Um, and he is alone on the stage. So we would call this, wait for it. Hopefully you can say it before I say it. It's a soliloquy. Okay. Um, Macbeth is thinking out loud here so that we could see his inner thoughts. And he is musing about what to do. He says, if it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow might be the be all and end all here. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. So I'm going to stop here. I can't see line seven. Um, and he's thinking about if if it were done, when tis done, right? So if the murder were done and there was no consequence, right, then this would be much easier. But he is acknowledging that that is not the case. Here upon the bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. He continues to say, but in these cases, we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instruction, which, being taught, return to plague the inventor. He's acknowledging that um, there's such thing as a guilty conscience. And so he knows that if he goes through with this, that that will be one of the consequences. Uh, it's important to recognize this here and now before we see what occurs later in the play. I'm going to continue at line 10. So this even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He is here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject. Kinsman, let me see if I can try to edit this. Ah, how cool is that? <laughs> so kinsmen, meaning family, right? They're cousins, okay? And his subject, strong both against the deed. Then as his host, right? He's going to be hosting him in his castle, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek and hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep, deep damnation of his taking off. So besides, he says, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, okay, and has such a clear office. In other words, he's such a good king that his virtues will plead like angels. A lot of people will be sad at his death, okay? So again, he's further thinking about what might be the consequences of Duncan's murder. And pity, like a naked newborn babe. Ooh, it won't let me scroll. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And pity, like a naked newborn babe, striding the blast or heaven's cherubed horse upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind, right? So he is acknowledging that so many people will cry because of Duncan's um, murder that, you know, oh, this is hyperbolic here, obviously. It will not drown the wind, but he's exaggerating the extent um, that Duncan's death would have on the society, on the community. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only, oh my gosh, I have to circle this like times a thousand. He has no 
spur. So those of you that have ever ridden a horse, you know, there's spurs on the back of your cowboy boots, if you will, um, that if you kick the horse, it will make him go. So he says here, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Okay, so again, acknowledging that the only thing that is, is encouraging him to do this is his ambition. Okay, now enter Lady Macbeth. We'll see if that's the only thing pushing him to do this. His wife is now going to enter the room. Um, How now? What news? He says to his wife. He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Macbeth responds, hath he asked for me? No, you not. He has, she says. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have brought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. So what is he saying here to his wife? Right? He's telling his wife, after we just saw this long thought process that Macbeth is um, pondering, he's saying that, I don't want to do this. Right. We will proceed no no further in this business. OK. And why is that? Well, he honored him of late. He gave him the, the name Thane of Cawdor. So Macbeth is Thane of Gloms, which is here. Thane of Cawdor is next. Then we have Prince of Cumberland. Think back. Who was named Prince of Cumberland? Malcolm. And that was a step on which he must fall down or else overleap for in his way is lies. Um, And then, of course, the next in line would be king. So he is telling his wife here that he doesn't want to do this anymore. Let's watch what Lady Macbeth responds to this. She says, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? These are rhetorical questions. These are not meant to be answered by her husband. She is persuading him here. She starts off this persuasive um, conversation with her husband Um, trying to knock some sense into him, (laughs) although you and I might not see it that way. Um, And does it wake now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou hast that which thou esteemest the ornament of life? and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting the I dare not wait upon the I would, like the poor cat in the adage. So again, she's kind of belittling here, belittling him here. She's calling him a coward. Are you going to live a coward in thine own esteem? Like the cat, this would have been a story maybe known by the audience in the time, um, like the poor cat in the adage that would get its paws wet, but wouldn't fully immerse himself it, itself okay Macbeth says pretty peace I dare do all that may become a man who dares do no, who dares do more is none this is actually alluded to in a movie that we might not yet get to watch this year called uh, V for Vendetta but he he's trying to tell his wife that he is a man she is uh, belittling his manhood, and he here is asserting his manhood. Excuse me, Lady Macbeth. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man, and to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. Okay, we're getting into Lady Macbeth's character here. So what does she mean by I have given suck and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me? She's talking about her experience having breastfed. Okay, Um, we. uh, this is the only line in the play that really kind of might hint at the fact that Lady Macbeth maybe did have a a baby or that they do have children, but we don't know 
um, much more. This is the only lie to, that alludes to that. And so she's saying here that she herself has breastfed and she continues to say what she would do. I would, while it were smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brain brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. Holy cow. <laughs> so she is saying that she would take the baby from her nipple um, as she was breastfeeding and she would bash its brains in. Yeah, this tells us that she's a little cray cray. Um, but all again, she does this to persuade her husband by um, making him seem weak um, and without courage. Macbeth responds. Uh, if we should fail, right? So he's considering like, what if this isn't successful? What if we try and, and we don't succeed? Lady Macbeth says, we fail, but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. So this line might be familiar to you guys, um, which was part of 32 Second Macbeth. It's a very famous line by Lady Macbeth. And she says, basically to her husband, that you have to be courageous, right? Screw your courage to the sticking place and we won't fail, okay? It's all up here. When Duncan is asleep, where to? The rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him. His two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the water of the brain, shall be a fume and the receipt of reason, a limbic only, when in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Again, all of these rhetorical questions, okay? This is a persuasive tactic, okay? She's persuading her husband that they can succeed at this, okay? So her plan is to the Chamberlain's will I with wine and wassail. She's going to seduce the guys that are standing outside of Duncan's chamber to protect him in the middle of the night. She's going to seduce them, get them drunk, and then they can obviously enter the chamber um, where Duncan sleeps to commit the murder. Macbeth then says, bring forth men, children only. Again, um, talking about his, his manliness here. Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but male. Will it not be received when we have marked with bloody those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers? So he intends to use the guard's daggers to kill Duncan. That they have done it. They're going to blame it on the guards. Lady Macbeth, who dares receive it other, as we shall make our griefs and clamor roar upon his death. Macbeth resolves to commit murder here. I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Corporal meaning um, all the parts of his physical body, right, are now committed to committing this murder, committed to committing. A little bit repetitive there. Come here, Zen. Okay, so I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat away and mock the time with their show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. There is more evidence of the theme appearance versus reality. All right, and that is the end of Act One, which typically is the exposition. So now everything is set in place. We know the characters, we know the plot. And in Act Two, we will see the rising action. So much more suspense to come. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Say bye, Zenny. Bye.